uh, uh, today is a special day for us because uh, it's joining um, as a speaker, uh, Dr. Antonio Villegas. He's infectious disease physician from uh, Dominican Republic. He uh, he's from uh, Hospital Salvador Bouquier and very much, and uh, also um, uh, a petition on on academic activities. So we're very pleased to uh, welcome him on on this uh, meeting, and uh, so. If you want to share a word about your your uh, activities and and your um, uh, and your hospital, we will gladly hear you, Doctor uh, <clears throat> Doctor Villegas, and then we will start with the clinical case. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for letting us uh, participate. This is a, we are very pleased and excited to, to form part of this amazing group. So I'm Antonio Villegas, I'm an internal medicine and infectious disease physician. Uh, I work my, I work as a, um, as a both in Serimat, that is a private uh, third center hospital here in the Santo Domingo, that is the capital of Dominican Republic. And as a professor of the infectious disease, the adult, Infectious Disease Fellowship uh, uh, in the Hospital Salvador Begotier. That is the one that I uh, do my fellowship here also in the Dominican Republic. You know, as I'm a young fellow, I'm sorry, young fellow. No, I'm a young physician. I only have two years uh, graduated from my fellowship. Uh, and I, one of the most interesting things that I have found and love and start falling in love in, in the ID is a uh, transplant medicine. Unfortunately, here in the Dominican Republic, transplant medicine uh, it is quite rare. We do only kidney transplant and, and travel medicine, especially because the uh, Dominican Republic is one of the main tourist hotspots in the Americas, especially is the, the, the main tourist hotspot in the Caribbean. So we see a lot of uh, tourists from around the world. So I have found uh, a lot for, for, for travel medicine uh, in these two years after uh, being a, a, a sufficient. <laughs> Great. So, welcome. Thank okay. you very much. Let me start sharing my screen. <laughs> okay. 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 So you're, you're seeing my screen, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, let's start uh, talking about this case. So we have a female three-year-old uh, Dominican. Uh, she's born, she's from Dominican Republic. She was born in a rural area here in the Dominican Republic that is called uh, Yamasa. Uh, she's currently living in Santo Domingo. She's actually unemployed because she is more dedicated to the care of her sons. She weighed uh, 66 uh, kilograms. Her chief complaint uh, at the presentation of the emergency department was fever, dizziness, headache, and muscle pain. A little bit of the history, uh, she came to the emergency department on this date, uh, on uh, July 22, 2023, with four-day history of fever that it uh, wasn't thermometers, just uh, she referred fever, that was partially treated with acetaminophen. Uh, she told us that when she take amino acetaminophen, she, the, the fevers go away, and in a couple of hours, the fever returned. She didn't recall any specific characteristic of the fever. She also was referring dizziness, fatigue, a general malaise, and she was also referring unstable gait, diaphoresis, frontal headache, photophobia, uh, and, and, and the day after she when, uh, she came to the emergency department, she was uh, complaining about dry cough, uh, but this was the, the newer thing. Because of the symptom persistent and she didn't, uh, she didn't get better with acetaminophen, she didn't uh, went to any physician or any uh, medical outpatient clinic, she directly come to the emergency department as a common here in the Dominican Republic, the patient usually tend to go first to the to the emergency department. 
She ha she doesn't have any past medical history. Uh, she don't have any medication history. The, her arteries are NSA and aspirins. She referred that uh, like five years ago she was uh, she, she received a prescription for ibuprofen and aspirin. We don't. She didn't recall the reason, and she started uh, presenting with uh, cutaneous manifestations. She doesn't have any family history. Any the only drugs or substance is daily coffee. She is married to a diplomat of the UN, UN Nations. Uh, when she arrived at the emergency department, uh, she came by herself uh, with, her, with her husband. She has a BP over 105 over 64. She, has a, she was tachycardic. She was a, a little bit of tachinate. Her, her rumor saturation was 99%. She came with fever with 30 nine uh, Celsius or uh, that that will be a uh, 102.2 Fahrenheit at uh, the general appearance she, she appeared acutely ill uncomfortable but she was seated she was seated and talking and responsive and cooperative her physical examination at the moment that she arrived at the emergency the only the the only uh, found founding was she has moderate dehydration she has dry mucous membrane. She had a little bit of turgency in her skin. Uh, she has a, a little bit of delayed capillary feeling. Uh, but besides that, at the moment of emergency presentation, she didn't present with any other uh, physical findings. So when she arrived from the uh, of the emergency, she she was put in an IV line with a, a ringer lactate uh, and acetaminophen for the fever. The, in the emergency department, they perform a routine laboratory, a complete uh, a CBC that uh, the white blood cell was 3.58, and the other thing remarkable in the CBC was the platelets that was uh, 69,000 at the moment of the emergency presentation. Besides that, her metabolic panel was within normal limits, and at the moment, uh, she was tested for an antigen for COVID, influenza A and B, and that was negative at the moment of the presentation of the of the emergency department. So, uh, right now, I want to stop. And uh, she was uh, performing a, um, a chest X-ray because of the dry cough that was unremarkable. And right now, I want to stop and and uh, hear all your questions, anything that you want to ask at this moment uh, in the emergency department. Thank you, Dr. Villega. Well, uh, that's when the, the the rest of us from the, the countries uh, share our, our comments or questions. Um, so let's begin with uh, UK. Uh, is uh, Dr. Calderon. I saw her right here, right? Oh. They may have problem with connection. So uh, what about from uh, Chile? Is uh, Dr. Gomez available to turn on the, the microphone, please? I'm still here, Sebastian. Uh, Sorry, I, I got a little late, so I got uh, a little bit off of the uh, the history. The story was okay, about so four days. Four days. Yeah, so of, uh, for do sorry for, for for the one that arrived a little late, I can do a, a brief recap of the case. Please, sorry. Uh, no, 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 doesn't matter. Uh, she's a female uh, without a, a female a thirty year old female patient without any past medical history that she came to the emergency department on July twenty twenty three. Uh, with four days of uh, uh, feeling fever because she didn't take the temperature with a thermometer, uh, dizziness, general malaise, uh, unstable gait that she refers, photophobia, and frontal headache. Uh, that's like main the, the main part of the history. Uh, and a dry cough that started a day uh, before she arrived to the emergency department in the emergency department, uh, the, the on the physical examination, only moderate dehydration, the hydration, the, uh, the rest of the physical examination was unremarkable, a chest x-ray unremarkable. And uh, in the initial 
basic laboratory that was performing on the emergency department, the only uh, point that we should mention is we have a white blood cell of 3,580 uh, 3, uh, 3, and a platelet of 69,000. That was the only uh, remarkable thing you know, on the basic initial laboratory. Okay, so uh, the things that I'm a little bit concerned about is that she had some CNS symptoms. She has a gait alteration. The headache could be mostly anything, viral, para, para infectious manifestation. But I don't know if she has any kind of uh, recent herpes reactivation or any other signs that could focus on the CNS, uh, especially thinking with this um, posterior fossa symptoms. Um, I would, I'm, this, the symptoms are very vague. I would maybe think in a, some kinds of meningocephalitis starting, uh, I would perform a CSF study, mainly focusing on this. I know that the fever may not be something very special, but uh, the other thing that would be concerned if I don't know if she has any other kind of uh, exposure, I don't know if she has traveled, the rural area in Salvador are, I don't know if that's very uh, common, the mosquito bites, uh, the headache, is there any other kind of uh, specification of the symptoms? Is this headache, is, she has eye pain, uh, then uh, is there any other malice accompanying the symptoms? Okay, so uh, starting with your question, the neurological examination in the emergency department was unremarkable. There, there wasn't any nuclear, uh, any signs of meningeal irritation. Uh, there wasn't any uh, uh, alter uh, cranial uh, nerve. Uh, the gate that was evaluated in the, in the emergency department obviously was, you know, in the emergency department, some evaluations are, are quick, but it wasn't uh, abnormal. She was walking uh, fine uh, at, the, at the initial evaluation. Uh, the headache was frontal and started uh, at the same time of the fever. So the fever and the headache started at the same time. She referred as a okay. frontal uh, fever, a uh, headache, sorry. She didn't have any eye pain, but she referred that she has a little photophobia. Uh, when uh, in the examiner, uh, when the, 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 internal, the, the first physician that approached her, uh, she was here, she was with a towel in her face, covering her eyes because the light uh, uh, was bothering her. Um, what, what was the other question that you asked? Uh, the least, many, uh, the most muscular ache, uh, I don't think I'm thinking about uh, river exposition, leptospirosis, or any arborvirosis. So about, she was referring a uh, muscle pain, uh, that was one of her complaints. Uh, she referred a muscle uh, pain in all of her body. She doesn't, re uh, she doesn't describe any particular muscles, but at the physical examination, she was, when they were palping her and examining her, she was like complaining every time, everywhere that the, the doctor touched. Uh, so it was like general muscle pain. She doesn't, uh, she hasn't had a water, a uh, river exposure uh, in the last, uh, she, she told she, she hasn't been in a river in the beach in a couple of years, in the last uh, year. So that, that, that part uh, she denied. Uh, she lives in a, in a, a upper class area here in, the, in Santo Domingo. And she didn't recall any exposition to rodents or rats, uh, at least uh, at the moment that was asked in the emergency department. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fraderoli on the chat uh, asked about tourniquet test or petechial rash. At, at the moment of the, the, uh, of the evaluation, she didn't have any rash. Uh, and and in the emergency department, they didn't describe the tourniquet test. So I cannot say if it wasn't done or it wasn't performed. So they didn't describe it, but they described that she had normal skin, a little bit pale because uh, a little bit pale, but even if she, even she's a, 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 a black uh, skin color, 
but that, that was like the only skin finding at the emergency department. Uh, thank you. And considering what we have discussed in now, uh, Dr. Estepa um, is uh, thinking about some differentials. He wrote down on the chat. I'm going to read it this time. Uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to say something, feel free to ask for, for open microphone, okay? But he says, uh, he's thinking about chikungunya, dengue, malaria, Zika, or maybe osmosis or leptospirosis. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for your uh, for your message on the chat, Dr. Estepa. And uh, Dr. Hellmans is asking about papilledema, uh, ask who prepares the meals, meals, and if there is any undercooked uh, pork meat. Okay, uh, they didn't describe papilledema in the neurological examination, but I, they didn't they didn't uh, describe it. But I, I cannot tell if it, if it wasn't performed at the moment of the emergency. They didn't describe it. Uh, who who prepared her meals? She she is right now unemployed and working as a, a, a housewife. She's in the house taking care of her children. And and she she didn't uh, she didn't uh, remember any eating any undercooked meat in general, not only pork but in general she she denied it. Uh, she she told us that that she doesn't like um, uh, to eat uh, meats, and usually the meat that she she take is usually chicken or fish. But she usually she told she told us that she has. She cook it well. She she is always well done and everything. She doesn't she deny any undercooked meat at the moment of the emergency. Thank you, Dr. Villega. Any comments from Peru, uh, Dr. Alave, or or we move on? Okay, so we can continue on, on the next round. We we will uh, re restart our comments, uh, Dr. Villar. So um, in the day after she went to the emergency, when she was admitted, uh, we uh, as a, we were called, uh, we were consulted, the ID department. And one of the questions that we, uh, don't know if they, ah, okay. One of the questions that we focused was on the travel history of the patient. As I told before, she's, host, she's wife of a UN diplomat. So this is interesting because she recalls a very interesting travel sequence in the months before the presenting symptoms. First, uh, she she went uh, from June, uh, from the first June, uh, June 1st, Till 20 uh, June 20th to she stay in Bogota, uh, Colombia because she was traveling with his husband for uh, working. Uh, in Bogota, she stayed in the city. She didn't do any tourism outside the city. She uh, visited the main uh, tourist attractions in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, after that, she were she uh, she traveled to part to France, Paris. From uh, from this day, and also she stayed in the city. She didn't do any. She only visited the main tourist attraction, the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre Museum, uh, everything that any normal tourist do. She she didn't recall in, in Colombia or or in France any a uh, a uh, 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 rare or uncommon tourism. But the interesting thing is that her husband is from Sierra Leone, Africa. And the the visit was a part of a travel that they were planning for visit for visiting the family of his husband. So they traveled to Sierra Leone uh, from uh, July fifth uh, of July till eleven of July. She uh, so I'm gonna uh, keep it there, and then she returned to the DR on the fifteenth of July because of the days traveling and everything. Uh, and remember that she, as I uh, recall a little bit earlier, she returned. She came to the emergency department on the twenty fourth of July, twenty twenty three. So uh, it was quite interesting. So 
does anything change uh, from this point out now? <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good uh, clinical clue. Uh, yeah, most of the comments were focused on the symptoms and uh, the the presence or absence of them. So uh, probably if there are any expert in Sierra Leona uh, may add extra comments. So what about another round of uh, differentials from UK, Peru? Actually, I would like to add uh, differential diagnosis to the to the discussion. So we mentioned the basic ones, uh, but when I see thrombocyte opinion, somebody coming from a uh, African continent, I think in malaria, oh. you can see there. So the patient, uh, I mean, there was, as as far as I recall, the hemoglobin was twelve point five. Uh, I don't know if we have a baseline uh, measure from before. Okay, well, this is on admission. I don't know if this is lower compared to the previous or to the baseline of the patient, but thrombocytopenia is something that caught my attention. That's why I think malaria should be included. I mean, this is a patient with flu-like symptoms, so the differential diagnosis is pretty broad. But whenever I see a thrombocytopenia, uh, some things come to mind, including flavivirus, rickettsial diseases, malaria, and uh, leptospirosis. So, I mean, I think uh, everything else was mentioned, but I, I would like to add malaria and uh, rickettsial diseases. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Well, uh, Dr. Estepa mentioned malaria, but uh, being unaware of the Sierra Leona destination. Yeah, um, and and talking about uh, malaria, um, Dr. Villega, is it uh, BVAX the most common, right, in the areas of risk in Dominican Republic? And and I have another question: uh, Is Santo Domingo uh, and around uh, and uh, an area of risk for malaria? Lost a little bit. Can, can, can you repeat what you were saying, Dr. Solar? Sorry. Yes. Yes. I was asking if in in Dominican Republic, is uh, BVAX the most prevalent malaria? And in case it is, uh, where is the, the is Santo Domingo and around our, our area of risk for malaria? No, in the Dominican Republic, uh, here is a low, in, uh, we are an endemic country with a low incidence of malaria. Uh, usually the cases here in the Dominican Republic are exported from Haiti or in the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The main species that is in the island is the uh, plasmodium. In Falciparum, and is Falciparum. Uh, uh, in Santo Domingo, uh, uh, Santo Domingo is in a, a place uh, of 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 um, uh, circulation of malaria. Usually, it's more in the more rural area, as I told before, near the border between uh, I hate the Dominican Republic because all the places in the border are more rural uh, than Santo Domingo. So in Santo Domingo. The, the main vector borne disease that you see is, is dengue, but not malaria here in, in, in Santo Domingo. Thank you. So uh, to point something important, when we were asking the travel history and everything, she told us that when she went to Sierra Leone, she went to a, a far place of the capital, a very rural area, and she recalled that daily, Daily, she has mosquito bites. Uh, 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 daily, because he was in a very rural area, a very poor area of, of Sierra Leone. She denied at this moment any, <clears throat> uh, she, she denied using any water of natural sources. She told us that all the water she was taking was tap, uh, bottled water or prepared water. Uh, she didn't go to any river, lake, or or well, Sierra Leone is a, has a beaches, so she she didn't she she deny any exposition to water source. Uh, she didn't she visit the house in a very rural area. She didn't do any safari or any ecotourism uh, at that moment. It, it was interesting because a, a person that has uh, traveled a lot only go to the 
main tourist places. Uh, she went to, to interesting places, but well, uh, she she's something that 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 uh, she refers uh, that in Sierra Leone. So uh, at the moment of the admission, the department that evaluated her didn't know their travel history. So she, she was admitted to the general world of internal medicine by internal medicine department. We suspended dengue without a warning sign. It was important that the first diagnosis was this because at that moment, the Dominican Republic was uh, facing a, a little bit of a, 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 a high incidence of dengue. Uh, we were in a kind of a crisis at that moment of dengue. Most of the public hospital and private hospital were full of dengue cases. So that was her main uh, diagnosis at the moment of the admission. The river, uh, they, they perform uh, IgG, IgM, and, and SSN1 antigen at the moment of, the, of her admission. I was negative. Uh, it's important to tell that at that moment in the Dominican Republic, we didn't have a PCR for dengue, for these, uh, these spectrum borne diseases, and HIV, hepatitis C, B, and VDRL negative. On the first day of admission, they start working with her, medicating her, medicating her, uh, and the only complaint that on the, of the admission, on the first day of the admission, the, at the first hour of admission, that, that the fever persisted, even with the administration of uh, acetaminophen. On the second day of the admission, she started complaining of worsening of her symptoms. She started complaining of severe headache. Now she was complaining of headache in, 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 in all, in, not, not frontal, but in the old head. She was more tachycardic at the moment of the evaluation was 130 beats per minute. And she remembered that her blood pressure when she arrived was 106 over 65. Now she was hypotensive with uh, 70 over 40. She star, they, they star uh, with resuscitation in the general war uh, without any response and she was transferred to the ICU. In the ICU, because of the history and everything, they suspected a septic shock. They took blood culture and she was started on meropenin and vancomycin, you know, the main cocktail of the ICUs. And after that, ID was consulted. We were consulted and we obtained the travel history, not by the patient, because she, at any point, she, did, she didn't recall or told us the, the history of the travel, but with the interrogation of her husband. And after the interrogation of that, we ordered a tick smear, a, a tick smear, a, and we were asking about prophylaxis, and she never had heard of prophylaxis for malaria. So at that point, our main diagnostic uh, diagnosis for ID was probably severe malaria because all uh, the past things that I have said. So we performed the tick smear. Ah, and during the, the integration, uh, this is from the yellow book of the CDC. Remember the Sierra Leone that is in, uh, in the west, uh, western part of uh, uh, Africa is an endemic place of malaria. So we, we perform a tick smear. Uh, this is the general uh, uh, look of the tick smear. I don't know if you can see anything here, but with a close uh, photograph, with a close shot, we see this image in this this beautiful image in this uh, erythrocyte, and and with this we confirm the diagnosis of uh, malaria at this point. Uh, so at this point, uh, we call the Center for Prevention and Control of Vector-Borne Diseases and Zoonosis. Uh, when you have this kind of vector-borne diseases, you have to notify them. This is a public entity. And they arrive immediately after, uh, when we call her, they arrive to the center uh, 15 minutes later, and they perform an on-site rapid antigen lateral flow assay test specific for Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. And the result is this, that the test was positive for uh, infection by Plasmodium falciparum. So uh, at this point, the diagnosis was severe malaria secondary to infection with Plasmodium falciparum. So uh, uh, do you have at this point any comment, any question, any thought or, or anything like that? 
Tick, someone asked for Tick's advice. Uh, well, that was a couple of minutes ago, but she didn't recall any Tick's advice. She told us that the, the only thing that she saw was mosquitoes. She didn't recall any Tick's advice. She only saw the, that in the place that she stayed in Sierra Leone was full uh, of mosquitoes. I have a question. Uh, do we have the, the level of parasitemia for this patient? Yes. So, uh, uh, let me, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, connecting everything, uh, we start thinking about the treatment. Uh, so, we thought of Sierra Leone. We already have the diagnosis of malaria. And remembering that Africa, uh, Asia, South Asia specifically, and Oceania, is endemic with chloroquine resistant malaria. And interesting in Sierra Leone, they mainly is falciparum, but in some places you can see plasmodium malariae, ovale, and vivac. But with the rapid antigen test, it was discarded and it was OA falciparum. Uh, something important that we were, uh, I'm going to answer your question, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, is that uh, when we, we were starting, we were discussing the treatment. Uh, and Sierra Leone, this is a close-up map, is a low incidence area for artemisinin's uh, resistance because it's a low, in they have found very low I'm incidence the uh, oh. of the gene PS KELS 13, that is the main gene associated with artemisinin's resistance. So after all this, okay, so the initial parasitemia was uh, over 5% at 5% uh, at this moment. So after recalling everything, uh, analyzing the case and everything uh, with the Secovest, with us and the Secovest, we start treatment with IV artesunate. The, this, this is the dose, 2.4 milligram per kilogram that is administered, sorry, at zero, 12 and 24 hours. As, uh, so, as the guidelines say, after the third dose of the IV artesunate, we have to repeat, a paras uh, we have to anal analyze the parasitemia and was uh, below 1%. So, uh, when when the, all the guidelines say, when you, have a, when you have a drop in less than 1% of parasitemia or 0% of parasitemia and after the third dose of IV artesunate, we then switch to oral artemete lumefantrin at this dose at zero at, at zero at the moment and eight hours. And the third day we repeat a third analysis of the parasitemia and at this point was we didn't uh, have any parasitemia so the treatment was uh, uh, going according to plan. So after this, we keep the artemetal lumefantrin, a PO BID, a, on the second and on the third day. It's important to note that the patient was recovering. She at the fourth day, all the fevers start uh, getting better. Obviously, after the after the diagnosis of malaria, the meropene and vancomycin were obviously uh, taken out of the of the medical order. So uh, a quick follow-up, the patient was discharged after 10 days without fever and in full recovery. Uh, but one week later, uh, after the discharge in the outpatient clinic, she came for a checkup. She was referring, she was referring severe fatigue. So we ordered a CDC at that moment that was a, a, that, that, that revealed severe anemia with an hemoglobin of 5.9. The uh, Dr. Gonzalez asked uh, if the baseline hemoglobin, uh, what the, the hemoglobin, the first hemoglobin was low uh, according compared to the baseline hemoglobin. hemoglobin. We didn't have had any baseline hemoglobin, so the baseline for us was 12.9 because it was the first and only one that she presented. Uh, and at the moment of the discharge, she went home with 8.5 of hemoglobin. So in the one week later, she has severe anemia. We admitted the in the general war. We we thought we thought uh, the our main diagnostic was uh, severe anemia secondary to the use of artemisinins. 
Uh, and in this and in this admission, we do a workup and we confirm the diagnostic of hemolytic anemia. That is the one of the, the, the principal complication of this type of medication. So she stayed here for a week. A couple of both transfusion later, she was discharged. Uh, she was discharged with a stable hemoglobin. And after a month, uh, after this last hospitalization, she was fully discharged uh, with an hemoglobin at that moment with 11 of hemoglobin and without any symptoms and with full recovery. So uh, at this point, I'm gonna end the clinical uh, the clinical case. I don't know if you have any, uh, if I, ask, I, I have respond all your questions and uh, thoughts. So if you have any comments at this point for me to, to pass to the more theor theoretical part of the presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Villegas. Um, I have a question for the countries that are not endemic for malaria. Um, just to uh, cross-react about uh, how available are the diagnosis tests and how available is treatment. Um, in the case of Chile, we have access to a, a, a PCR multiplex for travelers that includes malaria. Uh, we have the, the rapid test, um, the Binax specifically, and some uh, laboratories has uh, trained uh, uh, technicians and microbiologists that can uh, screen a, a thick and thin smear. And uh, for treatment, well, uh, marlarone is widely available and uh, uh, artemisins may be obtained through a critical stock of medication that is centralized. Okay, so th there is a an office that may be uh, triggered by notification, and then uh, the the patient can access to the treatment uh, after that uh, is uh, that contact is achieved. Mm -hmm. So how is about the uh, United States or or United Kingdom? Yeah, we do have uh, for the treatment of severe malaria artesanate available uh, by request to the CDC. But now I think local pharmacies will uh, carry that. So it will uh, actually now is pretty easy to obtain it, uh, as I heard from my colleagues. So that's our first line treatment. In the past, it was like more complicated because we had to uh, order it from the CDC from uh, uh, and it was, I think, out of the state. Uh, so it takes uh, a while to, to get it into the into, into University of Miami. And in the meantime, we used to do alternative treatment like for severe malaria. One of the things that I have done before is quinine plus oxycycline until I get the artesanate in-house. So, I mean, it's a pretty effective treatment, uh, quinine plus uh, second agent, but I mean, uh, I think it's very toxic. That's why we prefer not to do it anymore. And when I uh, was actually uh, listening to the follow-up, in terms of uh, anemia, and, and of course, artem uh, artemisin could be one of the, it, it was one of the reasons, but I mean, I, I remember that we have cases with co-infection, uh, plasmodium uh, falciparum plus vivax in a, in the same patient. And when we don't give uh, primaquine to those patients that uh, they can come back later uh, having uh, severe anemia due to a uh, reactivation of plasmodium vivax. So I think that's a differential diagnosis to keep in mind in somebody that was treated for uh, uh, plasmodium falciparum and then a month or a couple of months later comes with a severe anemia, could be maybe virus wasn't treated. So that's everything I, I have to add right now. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Well, that, that's a good point. And, and uh, just to, to rule out the co-infection of other species, uh, this referral uh, center in, in the Dominican Republic, they do uh, uh, just a smear uh, diagnosis or they have a molecular uh, uh, test as a complement for, for diagnosis. No, unfortunately, we don't have any molecular testing. The only one that we have is the RAP, the RTD, the rapid antigen the detection test. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the one that we have here in the Dominican Republic, 
is the one that detects the plasmodium uh, LDH, the lactose dehydrogenase, uh, that can that can be used for uh, plasmodium falciparum and VBAC. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have any molecular testing for malaria here in the Dominican Republic. I don't know why, because we, we live next to Haiti, but we don't have it here. So uh, you can continue with the uh, review part, doctor. Okay. So uh, uh, the focus of my review part is about the travel medicine, as I told this area that I love. And the main things, the main failure of this patient was she didn't receive any counseling before traveling, uh, especially to this kind of area, like, like Africa, any country of Africa. Uh, remember that the uh, the WHO and the CDC, uh, they told us that all persons outside Africa, well, outside any country that are going to a, a different country to receive any counseling pre-traveling. So she didn't receive it. So I'm focusing more on the key points of the prevention of malaria in travelers. So just to remember a few statistics in 2022, there were an estimated of uh, 259 million malaria case, cases in 85 malaria endemic countries and areas in the world. And the Africa region was the, the leading area of these cases with 94%. Importantly, the, the 90, uh, 92% of the malaria cases described in 2022 were secondary to plasmodium falciparum. Uh, 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 between six to seven percent, it was by plasmodium vivax, and the other percent was to the other non falciparous plasmodium. So when you're you're, you're doing a a travel a, a travel consultation for for someone who wants to travel, you have to assess the risk of this patient. So when you're assessing the risk of this patient, you have to to have two two main uh, ideas in your head is the, the, the characteristic of the travel and the type of person that is going. For example, when you're, when you're asking for the characteristic of the travel of the destination, you always have to ask for a reg uh, region that is going to visit. Uh, for example, uh, 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 besides malaria, remember that persons that visit areas of high endemicity of metallobetalactamase of gram negative with metallobetalactamase are persons that are at risk of that or presenting this kind of infection in the following weeks and months after those travel for example uh, you have to ask about the accommodation it's not the same thing for example here in the dominican republic when a tourist is going to a hotel uh all included hotel in punta cana that doesn't have to go out to see anything besides the hotel uh, 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 compared to the tourist that is doing ecotourism here in the Dominican Republic, that is going to rivers, to lakes, that are, uh, are traveling, that is staying in, in rural areas. Uh, that's something that you always have to keep in mind. Obviously, the season that the, place, the person in, uh, is traveling and the duration of the exposure. It's important the duration of the exposure because some diseases can have shorter or longer period of, of periods of incubation. So that's something that is gonna help you when you're evaluating a, a fever in a returning traveler. And the type of traveler is also important. The type of traveler that visits friends and relatives. So, so there are described persons that live, that used to live in endemic areas and move to a non-endemic area and then return to the endemic area. For example, for malaria, those are persons that have higher risk of getting malaria. That's something important for malaria. Pregnant patient, remember, remember that uh, for travel consultation on pregnant patients, usually the best recommendation for all diseases is to avoid the travel. And military personnel for malaria is very important because usually military personnel are, are uh, patients that stay up all night uh, in the moment uh, that the Anopheles mosquitoes is more active, is more uh, uh, biting people. Uh, usually it's personnel that doesn't stay in, in areas that are well protected against vector-borne and against vectors. 
So that's something that you have to always keep in mind when you're assessing, uh, when you're evaluating for travel medicine. So for malaria, uh, when you start uh, thinking about malaria, these are the main key points for counseling. Pregnant patients have to the, the best uh, recommendation is to defer the travel until after the delivery, if feasible, and that's important, is the person cannot de defer the travel because she, she wants to deliver in that country or something personal that ha she has to do. Well, that's important because the medication that we're going to uh, prescribe to this person is totally different. Obviously, the mosquito bite prevention, that is something that uh, we always have to ask when personal travel to tropical and subtropical area areas. Uh, obviously, uh, recommending avoiding outdoor exposure between the nighttime, especially for malaria, use of clothing covering more, most of the skin. That's, that's, that's one recommendation that applies for ticks especially when you're traveling to the U.S., to, to most of the north, east, and center U.S., that there are most ticks bites. Uh, wearing insect repellent, uh, remember that the, the two insect repellent that are recommended are DEET and picardidine. picardidine. Those are the best that they, they, they have demonstrated that they give protection to the patient for about between six to eight hours. That's important because most persons only apply the repellent in the morning and then in the night when they're returning to the place. So they remember that this kind of repellent has to be uh, reapplied at so, uh, uh, very, uh, 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 repeated times during the day, uh, sleeping with, uh, within bed nets and staying in well screen or air conditioning rooms, especially for malaria because the anopheles is a mosquito, the, bio, the biology of the vector is more for more warmer temperatures and more humid temperatures. And obviously chemoprophylaxis for malaria that I'm gonna talk a little bit right now. So when you're uh, thinking about chemoprophylaxis, it, it is good to remember that in malaria, you have two definitions, chemoprevention and chemoprophylaxis. Chemoprevention is medication that you apply to the patient to treat an infection and to avoid a relapse or a new infection after the patient was infected. And chemoprophylaxis is for, is for the person that doesn't have any, doesn't have malaria or is not infected and you want to prevent a new, a new episode of malaria. So when you're uh, thinking about chemo, uh, giving chemoprophylaxis, there are some points that we have to discuss is when the patient is traveling to a chloroquine resistant Plasmodium falciparum area, as I told, usually most of F Africa, South Asia, and Oceania. Obviously, the recommendation are mosquito avoidance measures and chemoprophylaxis. The order uh, that I write it is the order that is recommended with a tobacco, proguanil, mefloquine, doxycycline, and tafenocline, uh, tafenocibin uh, as chemoprophylaxis. When you're ha when you're traveling to a, sen a chloroquine sensitive area, usually the most recommended because it's most available sometimes is chloroquine, atovacom, proguanil, mefloquine, doxycycline, atafenoquine. So when you're traveling to a, a, a place that no is not a, that have both plasmodium falciparum and VVAX, it's very important because the chemoprophylaxis changes. So uh, that's important that when you're doing the travel medication, always uh, look out for the yellow book of the CDC that I think is one of the best resources, free resources for travel uh, consultation. And the recommendation is prima, primaquine, tafenoquivim, uh, atabacum, proguanil, mefloquine, doxycycline, and chloroquine. And in a, a subset of patients or a selected patient, for example, pregnant patient, the mefloquine is the therapy, the number one therapy recommended for chemoprophylaxis. This is uh, this is the a, a map that I'm showing the prevalence of uh, plasmodium vivax. Remember that the, the prevalence of plasmodium vivax is kind of obscure because of the biology of the parasite. Remember that having the latent states can a uh, Underdiagnosed the uh, Plasmodium viva. So this uh, uh, this map is by uh, 27, uh, 
2017, and the areas that are uh, more to the red, uh, for example, uh, in the north of Brazil, part of Peru, Venezuela, some areas in Central America, Eastern uh, Africa, and areas of Oceania are the main the places with the most incidence of Plamodium vivax infection. Uh, uh, but as I told uh, at the end, as Dr. Gonzalez po uh, told, you have to try to diagnose or discard Plasmodium vivax because of the latent and then the relapse of the infections. So uh, when you're uh, talking about chemoprophylaxis, remember that the chemoprophylaxis should be initiated prior to travel. The days uh, that you're going to start prior to the travel depends on the medication. So medication a couple of days, some medication a, a week uh, before, that depends on the medication. Has to be continued regularly during the exposure or when the person is in the country or area that is visiting. And has to be continued after the person returns from that area. They have been, for persons that are going to a mission, they're gonna stay more than six months, usually a year, two years. They have been, there are studies that support the use of long-term atovacone, proguanil, chloroquine, doxycycline, and mefloquine. There are studies and are recommended for long-term prophylaxis, but the guideline says that after two years of prophylaxis, there's not many clinical data. So uh, they recommend a at that point, if the person is staying for more than two years at that endemic area, uh, the recommendation is they go to a, a local uh, health uh, department or specialty for recommendation for continuing or not of chemoprophylaxis. So, thanks. This is a, was a quick recap, and I don't know if you have any question, any comment. This is my uh, email address and my phone number. Uh, I will be glad to talk to you at some point, anything that you want. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Villegas. Very interesting case um, and good participation from all the uh, participants today and and a good review to, to remind uh, what to do about malaria and con uh, traveler uh, counseling. Um, if there is no other questions, then we will end this session. Uh, but if you have any comments, please feel free to, to talk. Is, is something else you want to add, uh, Dr. Gonzalez? Well, I think it was a very nice review. Thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to do this uh, presentation, and uh, we really appreciate the participation of your uh, teaching site. And well, I think uh, that's it for today. And uh, okay, thank you everybody for joining the session, and we'll see you again in four weeks. All right? Thank you so much. Thanks thank very you. much. Bye. Bye.